Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of A Few Short Minutes, The Pod. Uh, today, we have the beautiful Philippa Scott, all the way from Queensland, Australia. And I appreciate <laughs> her. Um, she's speaking to me from the future. It is her weekend. Uh, it's Friday there. So uh, this always intrigues me in this day and age of technology, how I can speak to people in the future, um, <laughs> technically, right? <laughs> technically. Uh, so I just love it. It makes me giggle. I know it's kind of corny, but there you are. So you guys know already, <laughs> you know, to expect corniness from me. Uh, let me give you a little information about Philippa. So she is a mother of four and a new grandmother. Oh, that is super exciting. And she knows the transformative power of birth both its beauty and its challenges. After facing personal trauma, she embarked on a courageous journey to rewrite her own parenting narrative. I am very much in that space right now. This profound experience ignited a passion to guide others. Today, Philippa is a doula, guiding parents through the miracle of childbirth with compassion and knowledge. As a childbirth educator, she equips families with tools and informed choices. But Philippa's impact extends beyond the birthing room, as a birth trauma and parenting therapist, she shines a light on the unseen wounds affecting families. Oh, we're going to have a great conversation um, for sure. With gentle wisdom and unwavering support, Philippa helps parents heal and cultivate joyful, connected relationships with their children. Her story is a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the transformative power of choosing love even in the face of adversity. I already have chills. That is super exciting. Welcome, Philippa. Tell you introduce yourself. I just read the bio. Who are you outside of the bio? <laughs> I'm I'm a crazy chicken lady. Um <laughs> so I, I live that. on a beautiful I have a beautiful seven acres here on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. And I, you'll have to excuse my this is my sexy voice. So I have a bit of I'm just getting over a cold. Um I have four cows and about, I don't know, 40 chickens and uh, two dogs, two cats, two cockatiels, four kids and a granddaughter. And we have like a little, we have a little um, community here. My mum lives on the property, as does my auntie. Um, and we have people come and go in their caravans. And it's um, it's actually a really lovely space. We grow most of our own um, vegetables and fruits and stuff. And we're, yeah, we're just... Um, I'm just a I'm I'm a mum who has mostly teenagers now. So well, I have two adult daughters and two daughters who are still in there, um, you know, who are still younger. So um, 16, almost 17, and 14. So um, as well as a 19 and a 20 year old. Um, my 20 year old lives on the property with us with my grandbaby, which is just amazing because I get to be a oh big part of parenting her. Um, so yeah, it's, um, it's quite a, an amazing journey to be on. Um, and of course, I, and of course my wonderful husband lives, lives with us as well. <laughs> oh yeah, that guy. Oh yeah, yeah that, that guy. guy. <laughs> so a couple of things immediately. Um, can I build a tiny ho tiny home on your property? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just, just give me a hot minute. Okay. Um, I'll be right there. <laughs> Uh, cause that is my like dream is to build a tiny home, um, somewhere or get a tiny home and be somewhere and, um, preferably travel. And then, um, the other thing that I noticed about your, you introducing yourself is that you guys are the epitome of it takes a village to raise a child. And I think that is absolutely fantastic because what I know to be true, we've gotten too far away from that. We've gotten yeah. way too far away from that. And you see the consequences of it all the time. Yeah. And technically I'm a, I'm a consequence, you know, I'm a statistic of it too, because yeah. I'm a single mom. So yeah. I, and yeah. I, I challenge the concept a little bit that it takes a village to raise a child. I actually think it takes a village to support a mother. I um, love that. Because it's, you know, a mother can raise a child and yes, there are things that when you bring others in from the outside, they value add to the child. But if a mother is fully supported, she can do those things well. And it's actually about supporting families, you know, even when there are two parents. It's tough work. And it was never meant to be just two people raising a family. It was always meant to be community being part of community. 
And for 20 years, um, you know, when my first daughter was born, um, I just had major surgery. Um, my uh, parents were moving to Sydney and I went, oh, stuff this. Trev, let's, let's move north to your family, to his parents. I didn't realise at the time that his parents were not going to be helpful at all. But anyway. Um, it, <laughs> Live and learn. Um, Live and it, learn. Right. Um, so here I was with a three-month-old baby and I didn't know anyone except for my husband and his parents, all of whom were out working from 4 a.m. till about 5 p.m. And I was cooking and feeding all of these people and cleaning for them. So it was, and I was isolated 40 k's out of town. So it was a, it was a really, and I say kilometres, so, you know, it was That's a okay. good 40, 45 minute drive. Um, to get into a, the closest supermarket. But I didn't know anybody, right? So I would hang out in mother's rooms and just desperate to meet other mums. And it was back before you could jump on Facebook and say, hey, does somebody want to hang out? Like, I, I don't know anyone in town. Those days weren't there. You had to physically go out and, and connect with people. Um, and T Townsville is where I, I landed and, and it's a very transient town. There's lots of, you know, FIFO mums. There's lots of military mums. And so a lot of those women were craving community. So in an effort to create community for myself, I, I had to learn the lessons. Um, and I made it my mission to teach women how to create that community around themselves so that they could tap into what is when women and families work together, an incredible resource. Um, and... So I'm really blessed to be helping to teach new mums now um, how to do that and what that looks like even because so many people have zero idea what does community really look like? How does it feel? I can see your puppy there. That's mm -hmm. so cute. <laughs> you want to know what's going um, on? Yeah? Oh, you want some loves? <laughs> okay, give me some loves. Thank you. Uh, I can't yeah. hold you right now though, please. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's it's a really big um, thing, this community, um, and and creating something that um, that works. I, I had the privilege of speaking to a woman yesterday who works in. Um, she comes from. She's in Chicago, and she works with teens in an entrepreneurial um, space. So teaching them entrepreneurship, and she she actually. Um, when we talked about what I do, she was talking about the fact that very often teenagers are looking for ways to support their postpartum mothers because they're seeing the struggle that their postpartum mothers have. And so they want to find ways. And, you know, in their innocence and their lack of knowledge, you know, they think about candles and they think about care packages and things like that. But what does community really look like? It's very different to, you know, I mean, a care package can be wonderful for a, for a few days. Sure. But real community lasts beyond that. Um, and it's not buying a, a diaper cake, you know, that's, no. Um, <laughs> and it's not having a big, a big um, baby, baby shower, right? How about a, how about a nesting party? How about a mother blessing? How about a food roster for after baby comes? For about, sure. Right? Like how about somebody to come and, and a, a, um, they call it um, the seven sisters, you know, a program like that where you have seven sisters who come one day a week each for a few weeks and they just each come for a couple of hours one day a week. That's that's a blessing. That makes a big difference, right? Um but we're not, when, you know, and in America, it's even worse than in Australia because they, you know, women only get sort of two weeks off, right? And they're expected to go yeah, back to work. I went back. So with my, my first, um, I wasn't working, which was actually a blessing because it, and he ended up being, um, he's, he was born without an immune system. We didn't know at the time. And so it was a blessing that I wasn't working because I, Actually, I, I, and then I got a job right after, like we, um, when he was uh, kind of stable, we didn't know that that's what's going on, but he was kind of stable. So I got a job and then six months later I had to give it up because that's when yeah. he, he really started to get sick. And it was a lot of doctor's appointments and a lot of hospital stays. And even though, um, 
and I was doing um, advocacy work in a, um, a CSA. So it's a, it's a, it's a place where children who have been um, essayed, you know what I'm saying? Cause YouTube doesn't like those words. Um, so abused, uh, they can go and disclose to a forensic interviewer. So they're only interviewed one time and all the cops and the DAs can watch the recording. So I was yeah. the family advocate and I had to give it up. Um, I, <laughs> And no shade to my director. She was an amazing mentor. She called me the day my son was in surgery, life-saving surgery. And she said, how is he? And I said, we don't know. He's in the OR. And she said, you and I need to talk. I don't know how long you're going to be out. You don't know how long you're going to be out. I need somebody here and you need to be at home. And all I mm. could say was, I understand. And then that was it. Now I'm out of a job. <laughs> um, yeah. while waiting for my son to come out of surgery. And then the second child, um, I went back to work after five weeks because financially we couldn't afford it. Yeah. Financially, yeah. I could not stay out longer than five weeks. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's, um, you know, the, the fact that, and I think this is a cultural thing, right? So, and I'm going off on a tangent now that's, that's probably not where we were going today but culturally that's okay. Tans it away. I, I think and i and i i just did a um a social science degree and majored in sociology so i have a real interest in where these things come from and originate right so if we think culturally why are we forced to why are mothers in this position it's because culturally we don't actually value the role of the carer and so, yes. you know, in, in Australia, we have a huge epidemic of mature age women being homeless. These are women who have spent their whole lives caring for children, caring for their elderly parents, caring often for their husbands, and they end up divorced because their husbands move on, um, you know, to a younger version or whatever, or they're all just broken because people are broken um, and they're, they're getting more and more broken um, because we're not fixing it. Um, although I'm on a mission to help do that. But the, um, and I work with a bunch of amazing people who are also on that mission. Um, but so then these women are, they don't have a superannuation oh. fund for their retirement because they haven't been working. They, because they've been caring for children, elderly parents and, and partners. They don't have a home anymore. They often don't have um, skills that employers will look at because they're in their 50s and 60s and so how much longer do they have and they're not really up with the technology and all of these things. They don't have a rental record. They don't necessarily have a, a job record. So these women are, are, are couch surfing and they are, um, you know, they're in hostels and they're in their cars and they're homeless. We have two women in that demographic in our on our property. Um, so, you know, because my mum is, you know, has, has doesn't have a, you know, my mum and dad split. So we have this epidemic um, in Australia of these homeless, mature age women. But it comes back to the fact that we don't value carers, and we pay people to care for our for our family, right? That's a whole job you can do. But when you're doing it, and it's when you're doing it's it, it's really expensive family, here in the U.S. It's really totally. expensive here in the U.S. Absolutely, even if they're not medical, right? So, right. if we attributed that, and we actually created um, a way to reimburse the women who are doing this carer role, um, and if it was men who were doing carer roles, I think we would have funded it already. But when I mean, we're not, sure. and that's, that's a that's that could be a little sexist, but I think it's just you know every job that men have is paid um, in some way, shape, or form. There aren't many men doing voluntary work, but caring roles are often voluntary, and we do it for love. Um, and yet, there's then then we're we're left to foot the the consequences of that often alone and I think that's where culture needs to shift in a really big way is that we need to start valuing the role of a carer um, to the point where you know we as a community so value the role of the carer that we care for the carers 
and we we input into their lives in a meaningful way um and yeah that I mean and that's kind of an aside but it's it's a really important part of what we know in shifting I, culture i think it's beautiful you know it, every year in the u.s a study comes out on how much a, a stay-at-home mom would if she had every job outside of the home what it would cost to pay her her salary yeah. and this year in usd it was one hundred and eighty four thousand dollars, which is about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars aud um give or take a few sorry math real fast um yeah but i think that that is so eye-opening mm. uh, almost two hundred thousand dollars almost quarter of a million dollars for stay-at-home moms and yet there is no extrinsic value placed on moms. Yeah. It's just, uh, um, you know, something they're supposed to do. And what I, wh why I think that, you know, men don't have the same thing is because men have always been in the workplace. Yeah. Always. And yes, we can, like, there are feminine societies and yes, under God, like, I get it. But traditionally in the last hundred years, it was men you know, the majority of in the workplace was men. And so when women entered the workplace, it was, it was like, okay, so men have the job and that's it. And they come home, women have the job and then they come home and they have another job. Yeah. Yeah. For those yeah. of us that, you know, do work outside of the home. And, and I think that women going into the workplace and then being fed this lie of you can have it all, do it all, be it all. Absolutely. Absolutely imploded us and the meant and we are we are crumbling or uh, under the mental load of motherhood weight um i wish i got chills again do you know what i think is missing though there um because i think that you know women find their satisfaction in lots of different ways they they find you know there are some women who their soul is fed by being in the workplace and that's where they get their true um joy there are other women who get their true joy being at home with their children there are other women you know th and there are women who get a co have a combination of that um what that looks like should be up to every woman to determine and every family to determine what i think is missing though is that for a lot of women they're not really sitting in their feminine at all and I was, I, it's taken me a long time to come back to sitting in my feminine. You know, when I was working solely as a doula, um, when I was having my own children, I, I was re it was really easy for, for me to sit in my feminine. You know, men have a, a natural tendency to want to protect and provide. Um, they're in their top, you know, motivators, which is wonderful. Have at it. I was really happy being at home with my kids and nurturing my children and my husband from that space and then nurturing women as a doula. It was fabulous. Um, I, when, I, when I went into the workplace, though, I shifted more into my masculine energy. And there's a place for that. But I got too far into that space and I ended up with adrenal fatigue and I ended up bro really broken and my children ended up suffering. My husband ended up suffering and, and I suffered the most, but I really lost sight of that. And so I ended up with this adrenal fatigue and for me, um, I thought, oh, well, my job's a bit toxic. Um, I was working 50 hours a week. I was doing a university degree. I had four children, one of whom um, had just been diagnosed um, as being on the spectrum. Um, and it was at that point that my, you know how, how you're running in fight, fight, freeze all the time, right? So your, yep. adrenals, your adrenals are running, 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 running. And then all of a sudden I realised why it was so hard. And so my adrenals went, oh, no. See, we're not doing this anymore. You now know what the problem is. So we're not just we're not gonna we're not gonna work now for a bit. We're just gonna go. Um, we're just gonna go no no. And so I didn't have adrenal. I didn't have adrenaline running me anymore. And so I crashed. And I thought, oh well, I'll change jobs. 
because my GP, who was a wonderfully holistic GP, but he said, you're going to need about three months off work. So I can't afford to have three months off work. That is not happening. So I thought, oh, well, I'll, I'll find a, a better job, one that um, has more life balance. And, and when I was looking for this job, um, I found a, a job description that was calling for me. They wanted someone who had sales background, but who was also had quite an eclectic background. And that was totally me. I, you know, I've been a doula, I've been a childbirth educator, I've sold photocopiers. I have a very eclectic background. I've done, you know, so um, I, I, I applied for the job, but in my learning about the role, I got onto this woman's YouTube channel and I devoured it. And I emailed her back and I said, look, I actually don't care if you give me the job or not. I need to do this process. I, what, you're, what you have created is what I need right now to save my body and my sanity. So I don't care if you don't give me the job, but please give me the name of a really good therapist that I can go to to do this process with. And she sent back a name and I had such was my current job I had to schedule in sick leave um, for a couple of weeks um, and I did the process over 15 days um, just once a week um, for two hours and at the end of that process I was well um, wow I, my, my adrenals had resolved my fatigue had lifted my body functioned my brain was functioning and it's not fairy dust, right? So you don't you 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 don't all of a sudden become a unicorn and nothing bad ever happens, or you don't have to um, you don't grow anymore as a person. But all the pressure was out of the balloon, and I was able to then function and thrive, not just survive. I was able to thrive, and I did go and work for her. Her name is Judith Richards. And the process is the Richards Trauma Process, or TRTP for short. And I, I went to work for her, and within three days of working for her, I said, Jude, I need to learn how to do this process so I can help people. She said, can I swear? Oh, yeah, can absolutely. I, I, kidding. Okay. Yeah, please. She Plus, said, you're Australian, <laughs> so I kind of expect it. It's fine. Right. <laughs> she said, yeah. fuck yes. And... If you don't take this to birthing women, I will be really, really upset because you have to take this to women who have birth trauma. And so I learned the process and um, I worked for her for a couple of years and I feel so privileged to have been able to sit at her knee and really learn um, by osmosis in a lot of ways, overhearing conversations and just being around her all the time. Um, until I gradually phased out into my own private practice. Um, and, but it's such a, it, it was just such an incredible journey to go on and um, to heal my own stuff because I'd done a lot of work. I'd done a lot of self-development. I'd done a lot of self-healing and stuff. And, and it had moved me into new places in my life, but it hadn't actually gone back healed the trauma and allowed me to start from fresh. And that's what this did for me. So it was really powerful. But here's why it's important for birthing women. Here's why it's important for mothers in general. Across the Western world, there are there, there is a major um, cause of death for women in the first year postpartum. And it's not it's not bleeding out. It's not um, no, it's birth complications. Health. It's maternal suicide. Yeah. And in Aust and in America, it's higher than it is in Australia. I think it's in your I'm top two. Here, it's in our top three. Maternal suicide. Now, normally, when women kill themselves, this is a this is a big conversation. But normally, when women kill themselves, they do it in a really um, non-violent way i'm sorry okay? hang on a second i'm okay i just want to share something really weird so that's the okay. tears i'm so sorry um 
This is my brother's sweatshirt, and I have never worn it before today. Oh. And he is no longer with us. He's been gone eight years because he took himself out of the game. And I just find that so strange that I've never worn this, and yet I'm talking to you, and this is coming up, and I just find that fascinating. So excuse yeah. my tears, but it was shock. It's not, I mean, yeah, yeah it's just shock of like, okay, universe. <laughs> Yeah. All right, got it. Thank you so much. Okay, yeah. but that's just so strange to me that we're ta- having this discussion, and I'm yeah. I'm wearing this sweatshirt I've never worn before. I've oh, it's been in my closet. Wow. I haven't touched it, and I got it out today for some reason. And here we are. Strange, weird. It is. Yeah, you know. And okay. suicide's a big thing. I, you know, I when I was seventeen, I lost a partner to suicide, um, and it t- it it was a three year spin that I went on, and yep. uh, you know. I, but, you know, it's funny how we equate trauma in our life. I didn't think I'd had any trauma. <laughs> Shit loads of fucking trauma. Isn't, I isn't just that amazing how we trauma. mitigate our own? Yeah, we're like, oh, no, I didn't grow up in an abusive alcoholic household. I'm fine. No, you're not. No, I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> I was not fine. <laughs> it's not fine. Right? So... So we mitigate our own trauma. We do. We do it all the time. So, and I feel, and I feel your heart in in this. There's, you know, when when women take their own life, they generally do it in a really, um, you know, they'll overdose or something like that. It's yeah, not passive messy. way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't. They don't. When a lot of these women who are committing suicide in their first year are not doing that. And this is going to be really gruesome and hard to hear, but a lot of these women are doing it in a way that totally obliterates themselves. They're literally doing, they're blowing their faces off. They're doing things that wipes, that obliterates them from this space, that makes them unre because they don't recognize themselves. Yeah, that's how deep it is. This person that's how deep isn't it is. who they are. That's right. Now, we are not talking about this. We are not talking about this huge issue and we need to. And over 90% of the clients I see for birth trauma come to me because of obstetric violence. Now, we're only just now talking about obstetric violence. It's only just coming out where we've coined a term for what women have been experiencing. Would you explain that a little bit? Would you define define that a little bit? Please, because I I just want everybody to understand what the gravity of what you're saying here. Okay. So obstetric violence is any action on a caregiver's behalf that causes, that either takes away consent, causes a woman to be coerced, disempowered, or in any way um, manipulates her. So it doesn't have to be physical violence. It can be even the way we speak to a woman. So when, you know, there's, and so many people, so many women have experienced this. You go in to, um, you know, have a baby and the 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 nurse, oh, you guys have nurses like labour and delivery nurses. We have labour and delivery. Midwives. Yeah, we have midwives. So, you know, you go in and, and the midwife will say, we're just going to do a, a, a VA now and check where your baby is and how far along you are. She's just told you what she's going to do. She did not ask for consent. She did not give you the opportunity to make an informed decision. She just told you what she was going to do. You're in a very primal space. You're not really in a in a space where you're going to want to have a cognitive conversation. She's just come in and said, this is what we're going to do. And because we're raised to be good girls, we just take our panties off and get on the bed and let them do it. And that's seen as consent. Yeah. But that's not informed consent. And we often, even when we do get women, get somebody explain the pros and cons, often they give you the pros and cons in a way that is um, is biased towards what they want you to choose. They don't just come in and they say, well, these are your options. You can do this, the, the positives are this and this, or you can do this, the positives and negatives are this and this. They actually come in and they say, they say, well, we're, we would like you to do this and the reasons are this and this. And unless you ask further questions, they don't volunteer them. For legal reasons, 
informed consent needs to be all the information. Now, in a birthing situation, that sometimes isn't possible, but it also often is, and it's not being given. So those things are also equal coercion um, and obstetric violence. So there's a huge amount of people who are who have been at the receiving end and it doesn't it's not obstetric violence isn't about obstetricians it's about because obstetricians are only obstetricians because they practice obstetric medicine obstetrics is anyone in that in that field right so we have this epidemic where women are coming out of um, the birthing experience feeling like absolute fucking crap and it started from the very first time they saw a doctor after they realized they were pregnant right they go to their gp and their gp says pee on our stick well, i peed on a stick i got a positive no 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 you got to pee on our stick what the fuck a different for? stick right it's a different stick not it tests for a different this hormone is... that only comes through right. doctors when you're there <laughs> get out this of here. is my body this is my body yeah. i know i'm pregnant i've missed my period I'm feeling nauseous. I've I know I'm pregnant. I don't have to pee on your stick to tell me. But right away we've said no, no. We have to be the ones to tell you you're pregnant. That, yeah, it's almost like away. you might be lying. It, it's almost the the you might be lying. It's the distrust immediately. And you're not the and you're not the expert. You're not the expert in your body. Oh, you're not God. the expert yes. in pregnancy. You're not the you're not the expert. So right and so this is this is cultural and systemic it's not about individuals it's about how as a culture we do these things now the other part of culture that's really important here is that women now feel because there have been so many generations where birth has been shit women feel that birth is shit so when a woman goes to give birth now and she has a shitty experience, every woman around her goes, yeah, I had a shitty experience too. You just, it's just what happens. I, I oh, I'm not. thinking of mine as soon as you, you know, when you're talking and I'm like, yep. Oh yeah. That happened. Yep. That happened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. And it's one thing to be able to say, yep, I had a shitty experience. I really, I feel where you're at. It's a whole nother thing to say, yeah, it's just a part of birth. It's just a part of being a mum. You just got to deal with it. No, 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 no. We don't just have to deal with it. We don't just have to accept it. And birth does not have to be shit. I had two shit experiences, um, both of which I experienced obstetric violence in. And I ended up having two can, uh, fucking fantastic births um, where I took I took everybody that didn't need to be there out of it. And I, you know, so I had had a Caesar for my first birth um, in because I was induced and obviously my body, you know, and she was, and then because it was, I was induced, there was, I had the Pitocin, you guys call it over there, we call it Syntocin, yep. um, the synthetic hormone. It hurts loads more. And oh, yeah. so I ended up with the epidural and she was posterior. So she didn't move around. I got to 10 centimetres. She never moved down. So we went for an emergency C-section that I sat in the hallway for for an hour while nobody knew where I was. Anyway, it was not an emergency, but I was. Uh, this was the experience I had. So, and all because it was almost Easter. So I got induced because the obstetrician wasn't going to be there. Yes. He was right yeah so my next birth i'm like no i'm i'm having a vaginal birth and i worked really hard i learned everything i needed to learn i became a doula i had supported other v-backs i'd supported at vaginal births i knew what to do i didn't get to hospital until 10 centimeters dilated i got to hospital literally my first my first contraction in there i started pushing right? I'm like, I'm not oh, getting yeah. there until I absolutely like have to, right? So the, the car ride was was a bit of interesting fun going around the roundabouts. But anyway, it was, it was um, but I, I got there. I'm right just thinking of like your water breaking and then like continuing to leak in the car. Like, that's just like, <laughs> that's where my head went. I'm like, oh my God. That's what, how would I... that's what, that's what <laughs> are for. 
<laughs> um, and you just wear a pad on your knickers, right? So anyway, it was um, it was really, um, but the, the problem with that pregnancy was I had to fight every step of the way. I had to fight every step of the way to get the birth that I wanted. And I couldn't yep. turn up in hospital any earlier because the earlier I got there, the more they were going to interview. And then when I got there, I got a midwife who didn't like doulas. And so she created a situation where I, um, she scared the shit out of me right at the end. Um, my blood pressure rose. And after she was born, I lost a litre and a half of blood. Um, and Holy I had a second degree tear because she had me sitting on a birthing stool for an hour to push. Neither of those things were necessary. And she also had the paediatricians come in and take my baby for a few minutes to check them over even though there was nothing wrong with her and I didn't get that immediate skin to skin. So after they messed up my first two births with their bullshit stuff and I was powerless in those moments to fix it because you're not in a space where you're supposed to fix it. You're in a giving birth space, which is a very different no, primal space, you should just right? be. Yeah. So I went, I'm never doing that again. And I chose to have my next baby at home. And there were no midwives available to support my support me. So I had a beautiful midwife in the community who I did all my antenatal and postnatal care with, but I birthed my baby with the help of my friends and my husband. And it she was nine pound three. Wow. And sorry, nine okay. pound seven. My my grandbaby was nine pound three. My nine pound seven. And I birthed her in the water, caught her myself, and I had no tears, no bleeding. It was absolute bliss and do you know what when when I think about that I'm gonna cry <laughs> no please it's beautiful it it deserves think, tears of, of joy when and I of, think about of relief <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah. when I think about her birth she let me shine she let me um be everything I could be um, and I learned to listen to my body properly, I really, really listen to my body and listen to my intuition. I felt, I felt her shoulder hit my pubic bone. Um, and I was like, oh, okay, for her to get past that, I'm going to have to move. And I was in a, I was in a, um, in a squat, my husband holding me up in the, in the, um, I put in a, I knew this was like women used to time. squat in the field, right. you know, because that's yeah. the natural position, not laying down a goddamn hospital bed like yeah. we do here. It's terrible. <laughs> so I put it, I, I put in this big bathtub, um, knowing what was going to happen. Um, my husband's like, why are we putting in this tub? I'm like, trust me, I need it. And um, so we, we had, um, anyway, I just, I got up and I, moved my pelvis back and then I swooshed under and out she came. I was only 15 minutes of, of um, breathing her down. I really did breathe her down. My, obviously my body was pushing because that's what it does, but I I didn't, there was no sort of, you know, push. You didn't and bear down. You breath, didn't. None. Yeah, none of that. I wasn't doing this big work. Um, anyway. She was born. It was absolutely magic. And, oh, my God, she was huge. Um, and so, like, this kid had, she looked like Cro-Magnum Man. She had fat between her eyebrows and fat in the back of her neck. She was so chunky. It was beautiful. I um, <laughs> um, She's so small now, though. She's nearly 17 and she's this tiny little thing, right? Like, anyway, um, when my next baby was born, my intuition said, have a midwife. And I was so blessed to find a traveling male midwife from Scotland who was traveling around in his caravan with his registered nurse wife. And um, they swung through Townsville and he agreed to be my midwife. And so um, I, he was there for my, for my next baby. And look, he sat in the kitchen and drank tea and ate biscuits like every good Scot should and when I needed him he was there um oh and God. I needed oh, okay. him afterwards because <laughs> I had a little let bit me, of let me my afterwards <laughs> yeah yeah so and he was there when I needed him after the baby was born so 
that was wonderful. But my intuition said, have somebody. I found somebody and it was perfect. Now, that those experiences taught me and having been with lots and lots of women giving birth over the years, birth does not have to be shit. Now, where this really came around for me, having worked so in Townsville, we I, I led a group of women who um, created a birth center for Townsville. So we got this beautiful midwifery model of care for women. I couldn't birth there because I'd had a cesarean, so they weren't going to let me in, even though it was literally across the, you know, like it was a whole way from the hospital. Um, but I couldn't go. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to go anyway. I was going to birth at home. But it was, you know, like we'd done all this work. I spent a long time advocating for for women. I got really burnt out, which is why I ended up in corporate world again, which really wasn't a good thing. Oh, but, that's from the frying pan um, into the fire, sister. Right. So, but I felt like I didn't have any more to give in that space until I found the process that I use now for women. Now I have something really valuable to give because I can help them heal now. Anyway, I was going somewhere with that story. Oh, so my when my daughter became pregnant, I said to her, okay, I, are you birthing this baby at home or are you going to hospital? Because if we're birthing at home, we need to find a midwife really quite soon because they get booked out pretty quick. And she said, is that even a question? Of course I'm birthing at home. That's what we do. And she'd been at my, she'd been at the births of her last two sisters. So she'd seen babies born. And 20 years of hearing me talk about birth and um, and that it's, you know, the most normal thing in the world. And don't get me wrong, there are risks associated with birth. There are also risks associated with everything we do in life, you know, you can be chopping up vegetables in the kitchen and drop the knife and cut your foot. You know, like there are risks. Yeah. Some are small, some are big. You can be driving and have an accident. Like there are risks to everything. Nothing is risk-free. But giving birth is what women are built to do. It is something we have, um, we, we have the capacity for. So she had no fear around it. So we had we had a, two midwives who came on the day and my 20 year old daughter so i have all of my daughters are on the spectrum um and or, and three of them have adhd um we're a neurodiverse so, family here too all three of us all yeah, three of us yeah. <laughs> i was late life diagnosed like within the last year and when i looked yeah, back yeah. I, was, I was like oh shit that makes so <laughs> much sense that makes so much sense yeah, totally. Uh, I, I've recently discovered I, I'm probably, um, well, I score very highly on the ADHD tests. Um, the, I don't score so highly on the autism ones, but I, I'm also really high functioning, so I don't know. I could be, who knows. But anyway, my children all are. And so, this, you know, my for my daughter to birth in a hospital would have been completely overstimulating, traumatizing. But yeah. It would have it would have been a horrendous yeah. experience, yeah. And I knew that going in, but she had to make the choice. Anyway, we had two beautiful midwives who attended her birth. Um, we did most of it by ourselves, her and I, because she'd split with her partner two weeks before. And she, not once did she say to me, Mum, I can't. There was a couple of moments where she looked at me and she said, Mummy. <laughs> um, but she was in transition by then right she was she was in that really big part but she this this beautiful 20 year old woman birthed her baby in the water all nine pounds three of her she caught her herself nobody told her what to do nobody gave her instructions um she caught that baby and her baby slowly and gently came through to the world um as she transitioned from placental oxygenation to air oxygenation this this woman became a mother entirely trusting her ability and her body 
Not once did anybody question her ability, her body or her intuition. So she now can trust that. She knows she can trust her intuition. She knows she can trust her body to tell her what's going on. And so afterwards, you know, she had she had some low iron. So afterwards she said, Mum, I think I need to go and get an iron infusion and we need to go in. So eight hours after baby was born, we she still wasn't feeling right in her body. Um, and so we went in and we got an iron infusion and then we came home again. And but she has, uh, you know, and I'm here to teach her. I'm here to support her because it takes a village. You know, it's not up to one woman to raise a baby by herself. Um, and it's certainly not up to her to do all the learning. You know, she, I slept with them for the first, you know, 10 days. So she learnt on the job, you know. And you know what's interesting? Because of her neurodivergency, I, she also can't take on loads of new information at once. And I think for every woman, taking on a whole new being in one go, as well as recovering postpartum, is huge. So we did a bit of a couple of things. First of all, we did five, five and five. So five days in the bed, five days on the bed and five days near the bed, right? So it, it gives a bit of, it gives rest to the body. Um, and there are cultures out there that don't allow women out of the home or the bedroom for 40 days, which is wonderful. Everybody just does stuff for them. But even in those times, I said to Alana, okay, your first um, your first job is to learn to feed and to recover physically. So she learned to feed her baby. And it wasn't until day three that I taught her how to change a nappy and a newborn nappy. She'd change nappies for big kids when she was younger, but not a yeah. newborn nappy, right? So, And you forget over the years. So I taught her how to change nappy. And then on day four or five, I taught her how to dress her baby. And... Mm. On day 10, we gave her her first bath. And, you know, we did these things and gradually, you know, I did all of her washing and all of her cooking and all of her, you know, um, all of that stuff because she just needed to learn a bit at a time. She needed to recover in her body and she needed that space. And this is what women really need. This is what mums really need is to have that support have that those people who can say I've got you I've got you 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 there are things I can't do for you but everything I can I will you you learn these things and there are and there are beautiful postpartum doulas out there who are doing this work with mums um, but as a as a community we need to get out there and be helping these these women especially if they've given birth in a hospital, and especially if they've experienced birth trauma, because birth trauma can be one of two things, right? Birth trauma can be a traumatic event that occurs because a physiological traumatic event has occurred. Those things happen where a catastrophic event occurs, but they actually don't make up the bulk of birth trauma. The bulk of birth trauma is made up of women's experience of birth and how they were treated during their pregnancy, birth and postpartum period. You know, when a midwife comes along postpartum or a labour and delivery nurse comes along postpartum and goes, you know, looks at the way you're trying to feed your baby and goes, you're doing it wrong. You're never going to be able to feed your baby if you do it that way. Or here, let me help you. Or you have got, you haven't got enough milk. Let me get you some chop-up formula. Fuck, yep. that makes me mad. No. Yep. How about I support you to learn how to do this? Because, and how about I help take away some of your emotional distress because you've just had a cesarean and your hormones aren't aren't flowing naturally yet. And so your milk probably is delayed and your ability to bond is messed up because you've just had a, a, a disconnect in your hormone function. So in the cycle. bonding is there. Right? It's an it's incompleted cycle. Exactly. So physiologically, there are reasons why why the milk is delayed and the bonding is delayed. Let me help you find a way to 
re resurrect that. Let me help you bond with your baby so that your milk comes in. Let me help you process the birth so that you are, you know, you, we can let some of the air out of the balloon. Let me help you with your distress and let me love you so that you can mm. connect with your baby and your milk can come in, right? That's what should be happening, but it's not. So I know in the U S yeah. it's 24 hours and it's like, okay, uh, via con Dios. See you later. Uh, good luck. And there's yeah. nothing after that until your appointments, there's, there's yeah. nothing. And so if you, you know, you go home and it, you're literally relying on a partner if they're there or not, I, I mean, you yeah. know, or maybe you're relying on your mother and my relationship with my mother was not the best at that time. So that was not smooth. That wasn't, um, I, you know, all, all of the beautiful things that you're saying, I'm just sitting here going, man, I was fucking robbed. Like I was robbed. I came in to my, <laughs> yeah, right. Me too. I came yeah. into my second one. First of all, I wanted to do a water home birth after, after my first one, I wanted to do a water home birth and health insurance, which I know isn't usually, a, it's not a big thing for you guys or in Europe, but in America, uh, they get to dictate what they'll pay for and what they won't. And so they said, oh. absolutely not. It's experimental. No. So I had to go back in a hospital. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'm going to fix their wagon. I'm going to go with a birth plan. Here's my birthing plan. I want this followed. And they took a look at it and said, okay, but you're not going to get any supportive medication because I had said in their near transition, I do want to have the, um, the epidural because I did part his part, part of the first one's birth without it. And it was traumatic. I didn't want to do that again. I wanted to enjoy this one. And they were like, okay, but you're not going to get the medication. So then I had to make a medical decision when, like you said, I shouldn't be in that headspace of like, what do I want for myself? Do I want the medicine or do I want freedom? And I chose the medicine yeah. because I, I wanted to yeah. prevent further trauma. And that, that didn't happen anyway, because, um, no. I lost too much, uh, I lost too, too much fluid. And so he was still up um, in my womb, but like not floating any longer. So they came in. Oh my God. I just, I will never forget. It's been 16 years, almost 17 years. They came in, they slammed the bed down, the head of my bed down, kicked everybody out of the room except for my husband and started and said, um, we've got to get, we've got to get fluid up there. We've got to get fluid to him because you've lost so much fluid. And so they basically put sodium chloride into my body to give him a cushion to float in until I was fully dilated and ready to go. Well, God, that's traumatic too, because now you're telling me I could lose my kid. Like just, yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I was so robbed. And and, and then is, I wanted to go ahead. No, you go, go, go finish your story. Go ahead. Um, and then I wanted to breastfeed. I breastfed for the first one for 18 months. So I was cool. Like I'm going to breastfeed, whatever. And he had jaundice. And so they took him away and he wasn't feeding and he wasn't feeding. So they gave him formula. And, um, and then when I went back to my OBGYN for my checkup appointment, they put me on a pill, a birth control pill. And, um, a week later, my milk dried up, not even a week later. And so I called them and I was like, what's going on? And I had told them I am breastfeeding. And they looked at my chart and went, oh, oops, we gave you the wrong birth control pill. And I said, can we reverse it? And they were like, sorry. So that was that. I had four weeks, four weeks of breastfeeding. I was raw. And I emotionally still, like, I emotionally yeah. felt robbed then. I was really pissed off then yeah. because- this is what I wanted to do. This was my bonding with my son. And, and I had made that decision, that medical decision for myself and for him. And they were just like, oops, like it wasn't a, a big fucking deal. People, it was a big fucking deal. It was a big fucking deal to me. It's a huge deal. Yeah. It's a huge deal. And it's, and it's wrong. Um, the, and you know, you and I could probably do some work together. <laughs> Um, because it, it doesn't just go away. And in, I had a, I had a, I've had two clients, sorry, three clients who've had 20 plus years between their birthing experience and their therapy with me. Um, one who had 45 years, 
one whose birth trauma was 34 years old. Um, and she's actually gone on, um, she was a midwife, she's actually gone on to study TRTP and she's doing um, work in this in the same space, which is wonderful. But ah, her, that, was how, that was how profound her journey was. She had PTSD because one in seven women get PTSD from giving birth, right? One in three experience birth trauma, but most women don't know Never that they've about. got birth trauma when we're asking them, right? So we're asking them in that first six weeks. It took me three months to figure out that I was even cross about this, let alone birth trauma. So we're asking women too soon. Um, so it's definitely higher than 30%. But um, but one in seven get PTSD. Well, she'd had PTSD for 34 years. Um, she was completely, that was completely resolved with our work together. Three sessions, done and dusted completely changed her life um and and i've got on my um website i've got her i did an interview with her afterwards where she shared her story um so you can you can see that on there um but the um and another one who'd had a child um born um with cerebral palsy and he was 25 and um we did some work together and again fabulous results um <laughs> And she didn't realise that she'd actually been the victim of obstetric violence. This is the thing. Women don't know that they've been the victim of obstetric violence. No, um, I had no idea until you defined it completely. And I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. That. Yeah. 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 We got to get, we gotta get put up there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's right. So there's all these all these things we just and this is the problem that i have and it's part of the reason i'm i'm you know coming and doing lots of podcasts and talking to people because i want to educate people that because women don't know because culture just says yeah birth is shit you've just got to deal with it yeah, no, no, no no it doesn't have to be shit it can be a truly life-affirming empowering experience however no, you should never go into another birth to heal the last birth. You should. There's this concept of a healing birth or a, a redemptive birth, right? A, a redemptive birth makes me cross because that assumes that I have to redeem myself as a woman. Mm. I'm so not on that shit. That says you have to redeem yourself in order to be a good mother. You have to have given birth a different way. No, 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 no. Just no. Secondly, a healing birth. What a good birth can do is heal your confidence and can resurrect your ability to to um to listen to your body. It can teach you those things. It can allow you to un to really sit in confidence in your intuition. That's what it can heal. What it can't heal is the previous experience. And where that will come back up later is in usually teenage years. <laughs> you'll, you'll, oh, good. You'll, that, that explains so that, much why we're button heads lately. <laughs> yeah, all of that stuff really comes up for you because it's another really intense period. Um, and so, you know, you might get through those, you know, years of sort of, two to 11 then yep i'm good i've got a handle on this stuff and then teenage years hit and it's like and it's totally out of control and it's so different and that's when all that pressure and adrenals just come back up so i you know lots of mums come to me at that point as well so it's a uh, it doesn't just go away is what i'm trying to say that the 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 trauma from those first experiences locked into the body. And unless we actually go and heal that in your subconscious, because that's where trauma is stored, right? Trauma is stored in your subconscious and your subconscious is running your body. Yep. So we the body heal. Keeps score. The body remembers that's all of it. 100%, right? So if we, but we, what we need to get, and Levine talks and Van der Kolk all talk about the body and the, um, like that it needs to know that it's over right for in order to move past trauma well judith richards who created the process i used goes one step further she said it needs the body needs to know and the unconscious need to know that it's over and i'm safe now yeah so we take we take a person from again right 
So we yeah. take a person from fight, flight, freeze, I'm not safe, because that's what that is, I'm not safe, to it's over and I'm safe now. And the, and the nervous system re, re, uh, resets. It's like a factory reboot on a mobile phone. Now, you're not, it's not fairy dust. You're not a unicorn all of a sudden, right? But you have the space to deal and grow. And when new things happen for you, you respond differently and you manage that and you can work that and then let it go and move on and it, things don't hold. And there's an underlying peace and calm, which a lot of people have never experienced. I worked with a, a coach recently who was sent to me by another coach um, who has never had children. So we didn't do birth trauma. We just worked on her other stuff. And she had experienced a heaviness in her chest for decades. It's just always been there, a heaviness in her chest. And we got to the end of the first, the second session, and she said, it's gone. It's gone. It's, it feels really weird. Like I'm freaking yep. out. It's gone. I'm like, okay, that's good. And I messaged her a couple of days later and I said, how are you going? She's like, it's still not there. You're freaking me out, man. Like it's gone. And a week later, she told her husband that she'd been living with this forever. And he's like, really? Oh, I'm glad it's gone. Like, that's awesome. But it's gone. She's had, and it's not there. And she can now live in that lightness and freedom um, and enjoy, like joy. So, mm. yeah, it's really cool. But anyway, this, this is what, you know, so this is my mission is to, change the way women feel about themselves, change the way they feel about birth, change the way they experience birthing either before, like I love when I can get to a woman before she even has her baby, right? But yeah, preventative. Birth talk, Imagine that, right? people, <laughs> preventative health measures. Crazy. Right? <laughs> so Crazy. we can prevent birth trauma because we can also bully-proof people, you know. Bullies, bullies actually smell fear. They know who to who to who to do it with, but also it's when you predatory behavior, it, it is. But it, yeah, so and when you have all of this, you you can send the same. You know, they've done studies on twins and sent them into um into they've gone into military into war zones, and one twin will come back suffering PTSD and the other won't, and they look at well why, you know why did that happen. Because it's like we talk about the pressure in the balloon, right? If somebody hasn't got a lot of traumatic or distressing events still in their balloon, you can add something to the balloon and it doesn't take up all the balloon. But if somebody's got a lot already in there, they'll experience a traumatic event and it pops the balloon, right? Because there's too much. Yeah. So even even if there are things that happen at the birth, um, that weren't what they wanted, they won't experience the same trauma because it will be the, the balloon's not at capacity already or it's not close to capacity. There's a pressure so, valve. Yeah. Yeah, so we've let the pressure out beforehand and they have the capacity to work through it from a different place. So they're my favourite clients because we can avoid it, but... Um, but when you've, you know, when you've experienced it already, to be able to heal that even decades down the track, you know, your life's not over just because you're not birthing anymore, right? And women say to me this all the time. They say, I should have met you 10 years ago. I'm like, well, you've met me now. And we can do the work now to heal that stuff because it's going to affect you one day. If it doesn't feel like it's affecting you now, it will one day. It didn't, it didn't affect me till my oldest was 16. Am I younger? Interesting. So how how would women know that? And I do want to bring it back to PMDD and, you know, the mothers that we lose because of obstetric violence and birth trauma, because I think it's a really important thing to highlight. So I definitely want to go back to that. But how would women know that birth trauma is now expressing itself years later? What what are kind of yeah. like the symptoms? So I have a really great resource on my um, website, which is about 
how do you know the difference between whether you've got postnatal depression or birth trauma, right? And it includes things like flashbacks, right? It includes things like um, uh, a, dis a distrust, hypervigilance, um, needing to control. Um, there are all sorts of things. Oh, <laughs> you're hiding. <laughs> oh my God. That's okay, Philip. Right. Keep going. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Holy yeah. shit. Okay, continue. Yeah. Might as well just yeah. put my face on that resource. Just go, if you feel like <laughs> Stacy, you might have birth trauma. Uh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Right. Okay. Continue. Sorry. That was unexpected for sure. <laughs> so that's, and, and look, you can go to that resource and get more information. Um, but it's, you know, there are, there are some really, um, really key things that'll, that'll happen. Um, and you know, one of the ways that you can, you know, whether something is resolved in you or not, is if you, if you remember an event, right? Let's say I go back and I remember um, my daughter's first birth, well, my first daughter's birth, right? If you, I recall that experience in my imagination and in my body and I experience pain or distress at the remembering, it's not resolved. Yeah, I got pissed off when you were talking and I was like, God, fuck those guys. Yeah, yeah, there's still an emotional charge connected to it, clearly. That's right. If there's an emotional charge, you're not done. It's not fixed. If you can remember that event was painful but not experience that distress or pain or emotional charge, then it's resolved. It's fine. And you've got to be pretty self-aware to, and you've got to be willing to be vulnerable with yourself in that moment to, to diagnose that for yourself. You've got yeah, to go, sure. ah, yeah, no, I'm not done. Yeah. Um, because I can look at that, those experiences and go, yeah, I, it was painful. It was, and it wasn't right, but there's no pain there anymore. Yeah. I, I think that goes across the board for most trauma, I, you know, all trauma. it's not all just trauma. birth trauma, but all trauma. If, if there's still all an emotion of charge, you're not done. It, it, it's a right. trigger. You, yeah. It's a trigger. And with the... With the work that we, that I do with this TRTP, it wasn't designed for birth trauma, but it works beautifully for birth trauma. But we don't just do the birth trauma because nobody actually comes to birth trauma without other shit having happened to them. Nobody. Oops. Nobody's a unicorn. It doesn't happen. So everybody comes to birth trauma with other stuff. So we deal with all the stuff in the same three sessions. And you don't have to talk about it. And here's the other thing we don't talk about very often. I know we're going way over time, so I'm really sorry. No, no, I don't. But, I've got time if you've got time. I'm good. Yeah, this no. is a fantastic <laughs> conversation. Please continue. So we also don't talk about the fact that dads experience birth trauma. Ooh. Uh, okay. okay. So now, interestingly, one of my clients recently, she didn't. She came to me thinking she didn't have any trauma, but she was having issues with her seven-year-old son. And so she um, she was um, um, she filled out her homework. We did her we did her stuff, and I put it. She was follow, she follows my Instagram and Facebook and TikTok. I think anyway. I did it. I did a post on Dad's experiences of birth trauma, and she realized at that point that her husband actually the reason he was so shit in her second birth was that he was still traumatized from their first birth and he checked out and part of her just her part of what she then went through was this sadness in herself that she didn't actually realize they're separated now so she didn't realize though that he had experienced birth trauma as well um and we often don't. And men aren't, you know, they're, they're cultured to not experience emotion in the same way. They're cultured also to fix things. And when you put a man, so most men are usually in what, um, 
what Alison Armstrong, who is a fabulous writer and um, educator of you know the the of men that she she studies men and um, she's got some brilliant resources out there um, which I've found fascinating. But she she talks about the you know men and their protective nature and men and their their um, provider nature and their fix it nature and things like that. Most men when they get to the point of having children are at a point where they're at least consciously competent in their workplace and in their in their role you know they're, they're getting to a point where they know what they're doing if not unconsciously competent they're at least consciously competent you put them in a space where they haven't they it's not a natural space for men um and I, don't get me wrong i think men should be in the birthing room but we threw men in the birthing room and we didn't train them we didn't teach them what their role was. We didn't teach them. And I'm on a mission to change that. I'm I'm just about to release a, um, a, a course for men around vaginal birth after cesarean and the difference between that and cesareans and how do they choose. Um, and I can hear your gaming son in the background, which is fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, the, um, the, the, we, t we threw them in there and we didn't teach them that their job was not to fix it. We didn't teach them that there was, um, that there were things in birth that just needed to be and that sometimes we just need to wait and let it unfold and that it's, a, it's not something we do. It's something on the outside we just, we wait and we participate. So... The interesting thing, um, so I've had men who, who will say to me, I'm traumatised by my wife's birth experience because she was in so much pain and I couldn't do anything and they didn't do anything. And you and I both know, if you, you know that there is sometimes nothing to be done. It's just a process. So sometimes it's just a patience game and that's normal and natural. But if we don't train men that they can't fix it, if we don't train men that their job is not to, that, but that their job is to protect. To be, job, not do. That's right. Their job is to protect. Their job is to be strength, to be a solid foundation for a mama to rely on. You know, I had my women around me when I gave birth. But in transition, it wasn't their hands I was squeezing. It wasn't their laps I was leaning on. It was my husband's. It was his strength that I needed in those moments. Because that's his job in my world, is to be my pillar. And he does it beautifully. But it wasn't his job to fix it. I gave him two jobs. When I need you, be there. and when I need, and, and your job is to, t is to make sure the temperature of the water is right, right? So <laughs> Don't freeze me out, kid. <laughs> right? Even more. So he, his job was to make sure the water, and so he was, he had a job to do. Great. The women, Which gave the him women purpose around, to do. Right. He got to do something for the whole birth. He got to do. And when I needed him to be, he knew, because I said, you need to be here now. And I, and I, would reach out for his hands and he knew because I gave him those two roles so but men don't understand their role and that's traumatizing in and of itself and then if they are required to be this pillar of strength and the people they love sorry most okay. in the world <laughs> the people they love most in the world uh, he's being told that their lives are in danger because some and sometimes they're being told that for real and sometimes they're being told that because it's in the medical team's best interest to scare the shit out of you and they use this card with dads all the time right they pull they pull what, what in the birth industry is known as the big baby card or the dead baby card you know your baby will die if you don't do this and sometimes that's sometimes that's valid and Sometimes it's really not. Um, and who are, how are parents supposed to know the difference? You know, they put their trust in these people. Um, and the problem 
is that unless you have a care provider whose philosophy around birth is the same as yours, then you don't know if you can trust them or not. And you just have to go with. No, you get dictated to. Yeah. So that, and that, so that's part of the problem. And that's why so much trauma is experienced. But so you get these men who are told that the people that they're supposed to protect and they love are possibly at death's door and they just, and there's nothing they can do. And it's completely, completely traumatizing for them and then helpless powerless and then nobody even says are you okay go wait in the waiting room (laughs) nobody's checking on them their mates aren't reaching out to say mate are you okay that you know they've got no one to talk to they've got no one to debrief with because their wife needs them to be strong or their partner needs them to be strong. And this can happen in same-sex couples as well. Like, But, you know, they they needed, they're needed to be strong, but they've got their own stuff and know where to vent that. So what happens? What do, men, what do men do? They go into provider mode. And so they, co- they couldn't protect, so they provide. So they become workaholics. To 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 tap out, they become alcoholics, or they um, they become gym junkies, or like, but they tap out of the family environment in whatever way mm. they can because I they feel a, like. I just had a connection, and I and I want to ask you about it because um, I've never had this discussion before. I wonder what that has to do with weaponized incompetence around new baby, of like, oh well, you're the mom, you know better. Or what am I supposed to do? I don't know, you know, or um, I, I don't, what do you mean get up with the baby? The baby needs to be fed. You're the fe- feeder. Like the stuff yeah. that women f- experience afterwards from their partner. And I wonder if it's the birth trauma causing this kind of weaponized incompetence or this, and maybe it's not weaponized incompetence, but it's the feeling of maybe they truly don't know what to do because now the, that power was taken away from them at a time where they needed to have it. I don't know. What do you think? I think it's a combination of things. I I think very few men would weaponize that incompetence. There are, don't get me wrong. There are men out there who do that. And my husband's, my husband's one of them. He has, he, he fucked up my first ever cup of tea. And he said to me, I'm not going to make this right because I don't ever want you to ask me to make a cup of tea again. Yeah. I asked him once to make me a cup of tea when I was in a, like a day long seminar. And I said, I want a white tea. He found me a bag of peppermint tea and he put milk in it. It was white. It had tea on the label. <laughs> it, do I don't ask him to make me tea. <laughs> this what is the man I sent. This is the man I sent to the grocery store once to get white cho- to get milk chocolate. He brought me white chocolate because oh, white milk is white. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So he's very literal. I think he may be on the spectrum too. Anyway, <laughs> so I but that was not weaponized incompetence. That was just incompetence, right? So we we, we have these. Um, I, I think we have to be careful about labeling that sure, but of course yeah absolutely. i think there is a there is certainly culture that says and it's interesting because you know my um men of my generation weren't brought up to do those things necessarily they didn't see that modeled within their family men of gen y and millennials and so on they will see a different picture and so they ex- are expected to do different things but they're also generally sharing the household load differently too because their wives are working in a, a, a you know outside the home more so it's a different picture I think there is it's funny um Women, women get an oxy, women and babies get an oxytocin release when nurturing happens. So when a woman nurtures, you know, if you get a child who falls over and scrapes their knee, they come to mum because mum and child both get a release of oxytocin in the nurturing. 
But do you know what? Men don't get that when they nurture. But do you know when men and children get that? When they play together. Okay, that makes sense. Men, men and children get an oxytocin release when they play. So we are physiologically designed for different things as well. So, and I, I like, I, it would frustrate the shit out of me when my husband would come home and, you know, it's seven o'clock at night and I'm like, kids are got to get, start winding down and he's riling them up and I'm like, ah, but they're what all getting off to the releases, right? right? So it's a tough call, <laughs> but because it's good for them all. It's part of their bonding. So it's something you need to foster, but so we have to understand the physiological differences between male and female and how that, but if men are given a job, as a doula, it was always my job to make dad look good, right? It was my job to make him look like he was the best support guy in the world. And she would get to the end of the birth and she would say, you were so great to the dad, right? And he'd be giving her a cuddle and over her shoulder, he would wink at me and go, thank you, <laughs> right? Because I was his toolbox. I gave him, I I guided him as to what to the things he didn't know, to how to support and be the support. A doula never takes over from dad. A doula makes a dad look good, right? She's his toolbox for the things he doesn't know. And I think when we when we equip dads with what they can do and with how to do it, they can be fabulous supports. But we can't just expect them to know everything. I didn't expect my daughter to know everything about raising a child. I still don't. My, you know, she's nearly seven months old. She's got so much more to learn. I've got more to learn, <laughs> right? We don't know everything straight away. So we can't expect men to just all of a sudden go, oh, I know what I'm doing. I know how to help. But yes, if there is trauma, they will feel incompetent in that space. Men don't like to feel incompetent. Men like to know what they're doing. They like, and usually by the time they're at that age where they're having children, they are consciously competent and being incompetent isn't comfortable. So they will steer away from that and they will find places that allow them to feel confident and competent. So unfortunately, though, that then often means that women are left unsupported because the people, the per, the, because we expect one man and one woman or one family to raise a child. That's, that's why it doesn't work. It's because we don't have enough that, you know, they need more support than that. Yeah, um, 1,000%. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I do a lot of work with dads who experience birth trauma as well so that they can reconnect to their family because the single greatest, the, well, the most common time for a marriage to break up is within 18 months of the birth of a baby. That's got to tell you something. Yeah, right. yeah, if there's a common Every, thread there. Everybody's not, everybody's learning something new. Everybody's sleep deprived everybody's potentially somewhat traumatized or their own stuff's coming up. You know, I work with people even in fertility because their own journey of their parenting, so when they were parented, was so messed up, they don't, their body and their unconscious feels that it's unsafe to become a parent because they don't want to pass that on. So for a lot of dads who are, cajoled and um, tricked, it, you know, some women will go out and have, you know, will get pregnant within a marriage when their husband's not ready. Some women do that. Um, but if you get a man who isn't resolved in his ability to be a parent yet, then he's not going to show up as a parent in the way you want him to. That's right. And he's not, sometimes he doesn't feel like it's safe to be a dad. And so if we can resolve those things previously, if we can, you know, if he's, if he grew up without a dad, if he grew up with an abusive dad or, or whatever, he doesn't know how to be a dad. He's not being a dad's not safe being a dad, you know, 
parenting's not safe. So if we can resolve those things beforehand, then um, so much the better for the whole family. And that happens for women too, right? Women often have it, have mother wounds and they experience okay. um, lots of... Um, and look, don't get me wrong, we all... I, I promised all my children I'll fuck you all up equally. There's, you know, I'm, nobody's going to get out of this scot-free. Nobody's coming out unscathed here, people. Nobody. Right? Uh, because I'm learning too, and I, 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 and I love you, and I'm doing my best, but I'm human, and I'm not perfect, and so there are going to be scars. But I will love you as much as I can through that, and I will be your soft place to fall, and I accept you who, for whoever and whatever you are, and whatever you have to go through, I'll support you in that. So there's these. Um, there's these things that we have before we even become parents that then raise their heads as we are parents because we're not safe. It's not safe to be a parent. So resolving those things can be done before, during or after pregnancy. But if we don't resolve them, we have very, we, we cannot change the next generation and their experience and if we want to break the cycle we have to do it with us we have to clean up our own shit we have to clean up our own space and then we can then we can be the parent the person the partner we want to be yeah um yeah that's Absolutely. my rant on that i know i love it i love it and you know one of the hardest realizations that i've ever had in my life is how how i fucked up my kids how I fucked up my kids and now we're dealing with it. You know, yep. um, the difference is uh, the kids are teenagers versus mm -hmm. I, I think I've had this discussion with my parents, like maybe in the last year I'm 47. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's that. Um, and I actively apologize and say, I am so sorry. I, yeah. I really was doing the best that I could. And I, I know that wasn't enough. And I, I can't like, I can't, I can't go back and change it, but we can fix yep. it now. And so let's try to yep. fix it now. Um, yep. But yeah, and and being that, being that space where my sons can say hard things to me of like, my anxiety is because of you, because you were, you know, laying on the couch and to kept telling me in a minute, in a minute. Um, and I felt like an annoyance. So I would walk away. And, and if, if I don't, um, if I'm not the court jester, then you didn't pay attention. And, and I just, it kills me because that isn't what I was experiencing. What I was yeah. experiencing was I was absolutely exhausted. I had a medically yeah. fragile child who was beeping and, and, you know, machines and, uh, not sleeping and, you know, all of that, the, plus the stress of, of medical appointments and how do I keep them well and all of that stuff. I was working full time. Yeah. Um, yeah. and because of our old, our oldest, uh, my, my ex-husband would work in the morning and I would work at night. So we were yeah. always single parents. There yeah. was never, yeah. there was never a lot of overlap. Oh. So my youngest got the brunt of that where I could not attend mentally yes. to what he needed. Um, and I, it sucks that that's how it was interpreted. And, and, you know, so yeah. I tell him, I tell him like, buddy, that's not, I, I didn't mean for you to feel that way. I am so sorry. This was what was going on for me. It never was yeah. about you and my feelings about you and what I expected from you or how you had to get my attention. I am so sorry. I couldn't even take care of myself at that point. Yeah. And I don't think and, those and are it, conversations we're having enough of. No, that's right. And and it's one thing to understand as an adult or as a mature person. It's one thing to understand that, but it does because we can we can we can look at all the things that we did. As a parent, and I talk to my kids about this all the time, I say to them, yep, I totally fucked that up. Totally. That is on me. I did that. Unfortunately, I can't fix it for you. You have to do the work now. Yeah. I 
yep, it's on me. I'm responsible. But now, so I'm to blame, but you're responsible for fixing it because I cannot fix yeah. it for you. Sorry. If you were younger, <laughs> under eight, I could fix it for you. But you're not. Right. You're now too old for me to fix it for you. You've Your unconscious core beliefs are there. It's done. I I can't fix it. But I can show you how and I can guide your process, but you have to be willing and ready to do the work. Now, when we the – prob, the problem that I often have with clients is that they come to me and they're like, oh, no, I, I understand why my parents did what they did. It, they had a really, you know, they had a really fucked up life. They had, you know, they were really struggling and I totally get from a logical perspective and I have compassion for them. And that's wonderful. That gets you, that has allowed you to understand the space that you're, that you're in and why you are where you are. And it gives compassion. So it takes a little bit of pressure out of the balloon. What it doesn't do though, is heal the trauma. It doesn't yeah, actually you're intellectualizing at that point. Right? It doesn't actually rescue the six-year-old you who's stuck back in that time, who's just gone back to her bedroom again because she's been told that she's too noisy or to go away or you talk too much or I can't do you right now or who's felt unheard or whatever. It doesn't It doesn't fix that person. Yes, it, it helps you to manage as an adult or as a mature person, but it doesn't rescue her. It doesn't fix it for her. That's where that's where real healing comes in, is when we fix it for her. And that's what we do with yeah. TRTP. We actually fix so, it for her. That's amazing. So it's it, it's inner child work, but like on steroids, it sounds like. Oh, it's totally on steroids. And I can't I can't give you the secret sauce because okay. um it's dangerous for people to do without training. Um but uh, like what I love about this work is that it it's it's made by an Aussie chick, right? Whose experience of trauma would make your toes curl. Like mm. what she went through in her life was so fucked up. And she is the most real and raw person you'd, you'll ever meet. And this process, this therapy is so down to earth. It is so, there's nothing in it that doesn't need to be in it. There's no tripe and onions, she calls it. So, you know, it, it's only the only things in it are what need to be in it, right? Um, and you don't even have to tell your story. I don't need you to, I don't need you to, well, it's not talk therapy, right? Yeah, it's so therapy what for people who can't do therapy, it sounds like, or doesn't want to do therapy or whatever. It sounds like, like yeah, it's amazing. Sounds it's like, ther sounds it's therapy for people who don't want to tell their story again. And be and feel stuck in that. One of the yeah. reviews on my on my page says, in three sessions, what Philippa did, twenty plus therapists over fourteen years haven't been able to do. And this woman, I I actually worked with this woman um, within six weeks of her birth trauma, um, and her husband. They both went through the process. She was ready to to leave. She was ready to leave and because she thought he was the problem, she knew she had birth trauma. She couldn't even have a shower without having flashbacks. Um, we resolved all of that. She's now pregnant again and is not scared. Um, she's got some work to do um, and we're going to do some, we're going to do some coaching around preparing for that next birth, but she's not having visceral traumatic responses um around that so, so let's use that to tie into the beginning of you know women uh unaliving themselves due to their postpartum and caused by obstetric violence and or birth trauma and how can we further this conversation what can we do to get a light sh shone upon this so more women feel seen and heard and know that there are people like you out there that can support them. Because I think that's yeah. part of the problem, especially in the U.S. We don't know what we don't know. We don't know where to find resources. We are completely reliant on our health insurance to tell us, you can go here, yeah. you can go here, you can go here. Take a pick. Those are the three. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, whatever after that. Um, yeah. And so 
let's talk about how birth trauma and obstetric violence lead to, you know, uh, the suicide of these new mothers within that first year. Yeah. So one of the, one of, obviously, um, a big part of birth trauma is feeling inadequate, feeling completely overwhelmed, disempowered, and um, that can happen and and any normal person would have a huge response. But add to that sleep deprivation, add to that feeling completely isolated. And babies, the, the mothers who birthed babies during COVID experienced this in, even more intensely. Um, and they're not okay. They are not okay. I don't so think any of us got, are okay, but let alone them. Yeah. I'm, right? None of us are okay from COVID. None of us. None no. Of us. So they've got this huge... There's, there's this huge stuff happening for them physically as well as emotionally and and then and then when oh, they wait, share but, but wait, their story, more. right <laughs> they go to share their story with someone and that person says well you've got a healthy baby just be grateful that you've got a healthy baby what does that say to a mum it says, your hey, you're not matter. great. Your trauma yeah, doesn't matter. Grateful. And you're not grateful enough for your baby. So now I'm a shit mum and my feelings don't matter. So I'm supposed to just get on with it, but I don't know how. And I'm and I'm having PTSD like symptoms. I'm having trauma responses. I can't bond with my baby. My baby would be better off without me. Because I'm not good at this. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm totally out of control. I'm just gonna mute and have a quick cough. So I've got this, all this stuff going on and I'm told I'm not important enough to be heard. So the, the first thing we can do for mums is stop minimising their feelings around their birth experience. If a mum shares with you that she's really struggling from her birth experience or struggling with her postpartum or she struggled in her pregnancy or she struggled because her baby went to NICU or she struggled because she had infertility for a long time. Listen to her. Hear her. You don't have to fix it, but hear her. Don't tell her she should be grateful she has a healthy baby. Don't tell her that it's that it's what that that every woman goes through that shitty experience. Hear her acknowledge that it's hard and then tell her that there is help out there that she doesn't have to stay there, but that she can get support. And then turn up with a fucking meal and fold a basket of washing. 1,000%. <laughs> and do not ask permission to do that. Do not ask permission because every woman in Let the world is going to say, no, no, I'm fine. Yeah. No, 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 no. Let me know if you need anything. No. Call me if you need me. Are you kidding? No. I can't. I'm putting my underwear on call? backwards. I can't pick up a phone. Get out of here. Yeah. Right. So just turn up with a meal or three, put them in a fridge or freezer, write on the top of it the instructions for how to cook it in case her partner's putting it in to have exactly what it is. What else does she need to do? What? How many degrees does the oven need to be on? All of that. So she can just plug and play. And while you're there putting that in her freezer, find that basket of washing that either hasn't been put on or folded or put away and do it. Get the broom or the vacuum cleaner out and do it. And do not ask permission. Sit her on the couch or in the kitchen with you if she needs to talk. Listen to her talk and do some jobs while she's talking and resting. But do not go in there asking to hold the baby. She can hold the baby. If she wants, you, she, she wants to have a shower, sure, hold the baby. If she wants a few hours of uninterrupted sleep, hold the baby. But don't do it without there being a purpose that supports her. Really think about what did, you know, it's funny because my my mum thinks that I do too much for my daughter and her baby. Because in her world, you're supposed to just get on with it. Yeah. Right? I should have just, instead of creating an apartment on our property in the shed, I should have just kicked her out to find a place and be an adult. Pull your knickers no. up and go. Right? That's what they say. 
that's the generation she's from. And I said, why? Why? Was that good for you? Was that good for me? No. Did that work? Could I have, could I have been a better mother, woman, wife, person if I'd have had more support? Yeah. So why would I question, not provide that? Right? Would I, why would I not provide that when I'm capable of providing that? Why would I? And I do this for women I've never met. I hear a story, somebody's had a baby. I turn up and I and I do it. So yeah, why wouldn't I do it for my own daughter? My sister said to me, and this is funny because I supported my sister hugely with her babies. And my sister-in-law, I turned up with weeks worth of meals every time. Weeks worth. Filled their chest freezer. I'm like, here you go. I she, my sister my sister and my sister-in-law both don't live close to me. So I just here. And I just fill them up. Um, I buy casserole dishes from the op shop so that I can take a casserole dish, leave it there. That's yours. Next time there's a new mum who needs it, you take this casserole dish, fill it with something and leave it on her door. I love that idea. That's how we create community. We teach women by doing it themselves, doing it for them and showing them how much it, how good it feels to receive and then give them permission to, to, um, to give. So when we have this, um, so my sister said to me, but, you know, we, we in the, it's in the hard times that we grow. And I said, Belinda, really? She's 20? She's not 30 like you were with your first baby. She's 20. She, and I, even, I only got to there and she went, I take it back. I yep. didn't even think about it. I went into culture mode. I didn't even think about what I was saying. You're absolutely right. Her brain's right. not even that. finished. Her brain's not even finished developing. No, but even even if she's 40, she needs that. She yeah, needs true. that. And that's okay. It's okay to support new mums and it's okay to turn up and not ask permission because they're, they're, she's not going to ask for help and she's not going to know how to ask for help. She's not going to know what to ask for. If dads want to be supportive, they can they can help mum write a list and put it on the fridge. If you're visiting, these are things you can do. <laughs> put it up there. If you are visiting and there is no list of jobs on the fridge, help her write one and put it on the fridge for the next visitor. All right? Any woman who walks into a house, it's funny, I, I was looking for a cleaner a while back um, and I put on a post on the local Facebook group. I'm like, I need a, I need a wife. I'm looking for a cleaner, but what I need is a wife. I need, <laughs> and every woman deserves a wife, right? I need somebody who will come into my home and know what to do. I don't want to have to tell you what jobs to that do. Mental anyway. load. Come in, right? That come into my load. home and go. Oh, the what the 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 and, and I have a cleaner now who does that. She is. I don't. I don't have to tell her what to do. Okay, I get the sheets out for the right bed, put them on the bed, she knows. But I don't tell her anything else. She can see it. She's got a home. So if you, you know, think and, and create a group, if you want to give the best mother's, mother's present or if you want to give the best baby shower present, organize seven women in that woman's life to be her seven sisters for the first six to eight weeks. Four weeks isn't enough. Everybody does stuff in four, four first four weeks. Six to eight weeks minimum. Somebody brings a meal once a week and they show up and they do a couple of hours around the house. Every woman deserves to have seven women in her life who will show up for her in that way. If she doesn't have seven and she's only got four, you're going to take a bigger burden on, but don't do it. Don't, don't. Don't do less of it um, or find those other women who can't physically do it, but who have money, who can come in and say, we will, we will put money towards a doula, a postpartum doula coming in and doing those things. Or we will put money towards a cleaner to come in and do those things a day a week, right? What practical and, and have a nesting party instead of a baby shower. Have have everybody come over and yes, they all bring a plate so that they can share a meal together. 
but they all come over and they help make meals for postpartum or they help um, put, you know, get the place ready for baby, you know, do a spring clean before baby comes so that it's in a good place, whatever. But, you know, be practical. Nobody needs another baby, like a diaper nap cake. Nobody needs, you know, a stack of bottles. Nobody needs 10 outfits and 17,000 bibs and muslin cloths. Like, nobody needs that. And you know what? You can buy all that stuff on Marketplace. It's heaps cheaper and we're not creating a consumerist world, right? Like, let's reuse and recycle, upcycle, whatever. I don't care. But she needs practical support right now, not another five-pack of bibs. Rant over. <laughs> <laughs> no. I love it. I love it. And and I love that you said don't don't stop at four weeks due to six to eight weeks, because I, I remember you're bringing up all kinds of memories for me today. I remember that after the party stopped, can we come see the baby? Can we come see the baby? That it was very quiet mm -hmm. and it was too quiet. And yes. I felt it's kind of like the Christmas letdown. You know, it's kind of like the Christmas letdown and you're like, okay, now what? Yeah. And and it's quiet. There's crickets and there's nobody. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Unless you, again, expend that mental energy and that mental load and reach out and say, I need help, which rarely happens, rarely happens. And, um, and what I see from the, from the, um, not the birth part, the baby shower on is it's all about the baby and the and the woman starts losing herself before that baby is even outside of her body. And totally. that is that is such a huge chunk of my story of losing myself in the roles of mother, sister, wife, daughter, employee, friend and not knowing who I was outside of that that yeah. it literally blew my life up. It blew my life up. And it took my brother committing suicide for me to get back on track. Yeah. And I don't want that for anybody else. I don't want no. that for anybody else, you know? No. And so no. um, I just, yeah, I, we could, we could go for days and I want to have you back, oh, no. please, <laughs> because I want to talk about parenting after infancy mm. and, mm. um, you know, gentle parenting and all of those cool modalities and techniques that weren't around when these boys were growing up. I wish it had been because it, it's definitely more aligned with my soul, but I was just repeating mm. patterns because I didn't know what else to do. Um, so I, yeah. I want to have that discussion, um, for sure. Yeah. And so, but as far as the doula goes, um, and the, um, <laughs> the TR, TP, did I say that right? The TR TRTP. 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 <laughs> um, I want I want you to tell everybody where they can find you, what it's like to work with you, and and yeah, what that do you do virtual? Is it I could could somebody in the US call you? Like, what does that look like? Totally. I work with women in the US all the time. Yep, absolutely. So uh, most of my work is virtual. Even if you live up the road, I'm normally doing it virtually. Um, my office is in my home, so um, it's um, it's almost exclusively virtual. Um, so yeah, it doesn't matter where you are, we can work out a time zone that works. Um, so with uh, initially, we would have an, a, a connection call um, a free consult where we just have a chat and see if we're right to work together. I'll explain the process to you and what you can expect over that three sessions, but it's three two-hour sessions normally because it's a three-step process and we do them a week apart. So it's actually, it's it's not like you're committing to years of therapy here. We're just going to get in and fix it. Sometimes there's a fourth session um, if we have to unpack more, um, you know, we are layers, so some people have an extra layer that needs a bit more time, and that's okay. Um, so we have this. We've determined whether we're right to work together, and then we'll book in those three sessions um, for you. Um, and we won't know if you need a fourth session until the third session, so we don't book in the fourth one then. Um, Listen, I didn't know I needed nine years of therapy, but here we are. So 
you know? Yeah. And <laughs> and yet there's and for you there's more to do, clearly. Right? So <laughs> clearly, yeah, yeah. You've got you've got some stuff coming up from that that younger time. So um and from around that birth stuff. So, you know I I what I'm the people that I'm calling in though are people who are ready to be the very best they can be. I I'm this is a really this therapy is really quite easy <laughs> um to participate in. Um I mean I participated it in in it in the midst of my adrenal fatigue. So you know, physically, I was extremely tired and, you know, my brain wasn't functioning properly. So this therapy will work if you're in a very vulnerable physical space and so on. But this is, uh, you have to want to be better. Um, yeah. You have to be ready for the change that's coming. So what I'm what I'm calling in are people who are ready to choose to be the best parents they can be um, and to be the best person they can be, who are ready to show up to be that best version of themselves. Um, and if you are ready to be that best version of yourself, I've got you. I'll hold your hand. I'll take you through the process and I will show you how. You have to be willing to put yourself in my hand and let me show you how to do it. Um, and that means you have to be ready because it's pretty cool on the other side, but most people have no idea what even that that living like like that woman living without that heaviness in her chest. They've never been there. They don't know what it looks no, like. Oh, absolutely. I did hypnotherapy. Cool. Um, and I, and I, so that's where my anxiety lives, right here in the sternum. Yep. And I did hypnotherapy and it was gone for months. And I was like, what kind of witchcraft is this? It was one session. And I was like, what is going on here? And now it's a little, but definitely not there. And and like your like your client, it's almost like you miss it. It's almost like um I'm missing part of me because it was there for so long. And it's mm -hmm. kind of scary not having it because isn't it isn't it supposed to be there? type stuff. And so, yeah, I check in with it every now and then and I go, can I breathe? Okay. All right. Weird, but cool. <laughs> so, and we definitely yeah. don't want to call that back in, right? Like your, your unconscious <laughs> is so powerful. You can call things back in if you, Oh yeah. but part of the reason we work the way we do is right from the very first session, we actually eliminate the self-sabotage that occurs um, because Unless we eliminate self-sabotage and we correct any negative self-subconscious core beliefs, we will just revert to the same patterns. Eventually, we will revert to the same patterns and we will continue to do the things or call in the things that have always we've always called in. So we change that right from the beginning, so that the rest of your life, once once you've once you've healed the trauma, you can shift the trajectory of your life, um, and it's mm. so phenomenal. It's so phenomenal. I um, but if to work um, with me, you need to jump on my website or jump on my face. Sorry, I got totally off track. Jump on no, my no, website, no. which is girlfriend, please. ADHD. <laughs> I follow it. We're good. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm on it. And, <laughs> so my business is called Fantastic Futures, but my website is actually fantasticfuture.com.au because I couldn't get the S. Um my I have um I think I sent you the link to put on this to my bio site, which links my, tink, my TikTok, my Facebook, my Instagram, my YouTube, everything else. Um, you can, I think that, I think even in that bio link, there's a link to, to book a complimentary um, chat so we can, you know, talk about working together. Um, you you know if, if you're going to work with me you probably need to know and you probably already assumed i'm going to swear a lot so you got to be okay with that. it's my favorite people it's my favorite people <laughs> i do study after study people it shows that people that swear a lot are more authentic and actually higher intelligence sorry guys that's science uh so don't blame me it's science um you don't like uh, the f word yeah. 
there's science. I don't know what to tell you. Uh, <laughs> My dad would tell you it's because they can't think of a um, a different. They're not articulate enough to think of a different word. That's what However, my mother extremely. <laughs> I'm extremely articulate and I have a very large vocabulary, um, but sometimes fuck is the only word that'll cover it. I mean, yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that's very much my mother. So of course now I just drop F-bombs in front of her because, you know, whatever. Um, well, that's <laughs> sometimes, little, I just like to, sometimes I just like to be obstreperous. <laughs> I mean, exact. Look at that. Look at that <laughs> articulation. Look at that. Elo How very eloquent of you. Not a fuck. Huh. Interesting how that happens. Yes, it's 14 year old Stacey rebelling. I'm, I'm very self aware. I just allow that inner child to come out and go, you know what, Angie? Fuck off. I don't tell her to fuck off, but I'll say fuck in front of her. Uh, and she hates it. She cringes every time. And so 14-year-old Stacy's like, yes. I, listen, self-aware. Um, I just let her out every now and then because she needs she needs that pressure valve. She needs that pressure valve. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Well, um, I, I'd, love to, I'd love to help 14-year-old Stacy. <laughs> I yeah, absolutely. That's going to happen for sure. We are definitely going to uh, do that for sure. Uh, you guys, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for hanging around. I hope you guys got value out of this. I'm going to have um, Philippa back and we're going to talk about actual parenting since we talked about <laughs> pre-parenting um, and uh, have that discussion because I know, you know, it's interesting that in order to drive a car, we have to take a test and we've gotten a manual. The ma there's a manual for the car. There's a manual for the test, uh, you know, all of that. But to have a kid, like there's no, I mean, Dr. Spock, but that's also 40 plus years old. Uh, so and total things bullshit. are <laughs> and total bullshit. Things have changed, my friends. Things have changed. And so I'm going to have her back and we're going to have that discussion of, you know, how to fuck up your kids to the least amount as possible. That's probably <laughs> what that's going to that's that's probably what the discussion is going to be. How to fuck up your kids the least amount of possible. So I hope you guys join <laughs> us. Um, do all the YouTube things, you guys. Hit, subscribe, like, hit the bell. Um, you know, do all the things. I don't need to tell you it's 2024, please. And um, all of her stuff is going to be below in the description. Go find her, get that connection call. If you're just even the least bit curious, grab that mm. connection call and see. You don't know until you ask, until you connect with her and see. Um, so go do that. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your time and your energy. This has been absolutely amazing. And I'm going to have you back. Uh, you guys, it literally takes just a few short minutes, as she'll tell you, as she'll tell you, a few short <laughs> minutes a day um, of mindfulness, of being present, of, you know, just being self-aware. And you can actually rewire your brain that way. So I love you. Thanks for being here. And I'll see you next time. Bye.